Hello everyone, today we'll be starting a new lecture series by talking about postmodernism, and this video will introduce some of the core concepts and ideas linked to it. Here is an overview of today's lecture. We'll begin by talking about what postmodernism is and why it's especially relevant today. Then we'll consider the question of whether objective truth exists and how different postmodernists might answer the question. Then whether there still is such thing as reality in the postmodern age which we live in today. What postmodern views are about the nature of language. Whether it's neo-Marxism in disguise, which is phrased by Jordan Peterson and we'll consider factually whether that's a correct statement. And we'll also talk about where it actually began. Okay, what is postmodernism and why is it especially relevant today? In short, postmodernism is a system of theories and ideas from around the 1960s to the present, which are all skeptical, critical of human reason and believe that everything is relative and based on perspective. So as you can see, there are some similarities between postmodernism and classical skepticism in the Enlightenment and like in Cartesian dualism, but postmodernism just takes it a step further. And instead of finding a place where you can't, where you can't doubt something and still a fundamental groundwork for human reason to operate within, postmodernism basically doubts everything. And then from the idea that there is nothing that cannot be doubted, it builds a system from that. And it branches out into many different fields of study, including psychoanalysis, sociology, philosophy, politics, economics, and linguistics. But then again, postmodernism isn't really tied together by some single unified theory or idea, and instead it's more correctly categorized as just a time frame. But then within that time frame, there are similarities between the different theories because some of the theories are really different and even contradict one another. And evidently it's especially relevant today because we live in the postmodern age and postmodernism is still an incomplete system because it's still ongoing. There are still postmodern thinkers developing ideas and it's very relevant because it considers the impacts of things like consumerism and modern pop culture on the way we live today. So instead of just abstracting themes from philosophers of the past, postmodernists actually consider the very things which surround us in the world we live in today and then evaluate how those specific things have impacts on us. And so this means that postmodernism may be the most relevant philosophy in the time we currently live in. And here's an image from Google which compares the different theories which can be categorized into the pre-modern, modern, and postmodern. So in the pre-modern age, which was really traditional, people were generally theists and believed in God and thought God put everything there and everything was part of a predetermined divine plan. And there are still people who believe in these traditional theories, but in the pre-modern age, pretty much everyone believed in them. And in the modern age, people just wanted to go onwards and upwards with inevitable progress. So with things like industrialization and the development of technology and the sciences. But in the postmodern age, it just refutes everything that came before and everything's now a mess because we now realize that everything we've been thinking about earlier may have just been based on some intuitive idea of the things being accurate and correct. And we can just make an entirely new system based on that. So everything is false. And that's a common view held by postmodern thinkers. And so they just want to go against traditional 
ideas and build something new entirely. Now, does objective truth exist? So this is an interesting question that was considered by many philosophers in the past before. And if you believe in God or some higher source of power or something that can give you value and comfort, then you'll definitely want to believe that objective truth exists. But then the postmodernists are rather nihilistic. And one of the postmodernists called John Baudrillard described himself as a nihilist, not as a postmodernist. So they're really pessimistic about things. And they think that objective truth, absolute truth, absolutely does not exist. And that is one of the most fundamental ideas that tie them all together. And it's a recurring theme among many postmodern works. And a possible reason for this lies in how everything which is supposedly objective is only possible if a subject knows and therefore interprets the objective thing. So if objectivity is only possible through subjectivity, then objectivity cannot exist. And one might attempt to critique this idea by asking whether it is objective that objective truth does not exist and therefore exposing a contradiction based on the self-referential idea of objectivity. So what about the state of the statement itself? In the proposition, objective truth does not exist. Would that be true? Would that be objective? And the above criticism is not valid, however, because the proposition objective truth to some exist must transcend the objectivity subjectivity distinction entirely in order to speak about the nature of the distinction. So this links back to a Wittgensteinian idea of language enclosing around the objects of the world um, yeah, so if you have a statement and you need to enclose it around something, in this case, that's the objectivity-subjectivity distinction. So if you want to talk about that object or that distinction, then it must be more than just that distinction itself. So the objectivity-subjectivity distinction would, in this sense, be like a subset of the statement. Now we're moving on. Is there still such thing as reality in the postmodern age? And this thinker on the right is called John Baudrillard, who I referenced earlier, and he would argue no, because the conventional idea of reality relies upon the existence of objective truth, and many other postmodernists would agree with this. And he would add to this by arguing in his book, Simulacra and Simulation, that everything in the postmodern age has become what he calls simulacra, which is a copy of a copy without an original. And he thought that in the consumerist societies we live in, we no longer buy commodities for their utilitary or monetary value, but for their sign value and what the commodity simulates so, for example, people will buy a celebrity's merchandise, not for the merchandise itself, but for how the merchandise is representative of the celebrity. And this really goes against the traditional Marxist idea that value is either based on utility or exchange value. And Baudrillard just flips this all around and says that in the postmodern age, no one really buys it for those reasons and only for the sign value. And in his books, he would then add to this by saying that in the postmodern age, what the utilitary value or the exchange value is, has itself become a form of the sign value. So all value is now sign value. And so everything has been reduced to what it symbolizes, and the symbol makes the object of the symbolization non-existent. So in other words, Everything has become what Baudrillard calls hyperrealities, which are copies of something which seem more real or authentic than the original. And if we map this 
idea onto Plato's allegory of the cave, which sets up the traditional dichotomy between truth and illusion, reality and fantasy, idea and object, and the light and darkness, means that there isn't anything outside of the cave, and part of the illusion is believing that there is something outside of the cave. And there's this modern philosopher called Slavoj Žižek, and he would extend this idea by arguing that in the world we live in today, everything is made up of ideology, and ideology in this sense is not just confined to political ideologies, but also ways we look at the world, like any form of understanding or perceiving the world. And so Zizek would then argue that part of ideology is believing that you can escape that ideology. Now, what are postmodern views about the nature of language? And this sort of ties back into how postmodernism can extend into linguistics and cryptography a bit. And I find these views really interesting because they really make you consider language in a whole new way, which is very vastly different to other philosophers in the past about language. And so if you're a postmodernist and you're interested in language, then you're also a post-structuralist. And postmodernism really just began with post-structuralism as a linguistic theory and then extended into something else. So into the other branches we talked about earlier, like sociology, philosophy, economics, etc. And to understand post-structuralism, we should first consider structuralism. And structuralism was a school of thought founded by Ferdinand de Saussure. And it's a very traditional way of looking at linguistics. And they believe that the meaning of something in language is not known through its definition, but through the context in which it's surrounded by and a person's exposure to those different contexts. And if you think about it, it makes sense because let's say, for example, you are wanting to learn a completely new language that you've never seen before and you open a dictionary in about that language, but then you're not going to understand that language at all from just reading the dictionary because each word would have to be defined through other words and then these other words would then have to be defined by other words and then by other words and then by other words. So really you can't start understanding the language from some fundamental structure going from the ground up, but you just have to jump around from different spaces to try and understand the language. And this is very unique to the structuralist Saussure, who founded the School of Structuralism, but they think the signifier signify distinction is arbitrary. So basically what word signifies what object in the world is arbitrary. And so the word itself is unimportant, yet how the word signifies something else is. So let's say you take a tree, but then I call it something else. I'll just call it a bird. Then whether I call a tree a tree or a tree a bird is irrelevant because you can still have the same sort of understanding. So they think the signifier signified distinction is completely arbitrary. And the way we modify language to suit the objects in the real world is something that's completely by chance. And this opposes some of the traditional views about language, such as Rousseau's theory, which says that language began in love. So language doesn't really begin in love. It's just a sort of process that is used to understand the world, but then the way this works is completely arbitrary and random. And post-structuralists then develop this structuralist idea further by arguing that all meaning would be relative and open to interpretation 
So the context that a word is in doesn't affect the meaning of the word either, and only the subject which knows the word does. So basically, everything is relative, everything is subjective, meaning is completely reliant upon the subject. And I guess you could also link this to how, at the time, Einstein's general theory of relativity was gaining popularity. So the idea of everything being dependent or relative to the subject was gaining some traction. And therefore, language would be a system that relies completely on the user of the language. And so a truth and meaning that is not subjective or not, not detached from the subject would be impossible. And now we'll consider Jordan Peterson's idea that postmodernism is neo-Marxism in disguise. And he said in many YouTube videos that he strongly dislikes postmodernism, and he often critiques postmodern ideas and use them as an example of neo-communism or neo-Marxism in the postmodern world. And he thinks that postmodernism is a really faulty theory because he believes it is neo-Marxism in disguise, and he strongly opposes neo-Marxism as a conservative. And some postmodernism, such as Michel Foucault, used to be neo-Marxist, but this does not mean that postmodernism as a whole is neo-Marxist. And in fact, postmodern theories can differ and vary in many ways. So postmodernism doesn't necessarily need to be taken in a left-wing direction. So for example, Thomas Kuhn was a right-wing postmodernism, postmodernist, and he was a strong traditionalist and believed in many conservative ideas. And there's also the alt-right thinker called Nick Land, who's still living today, and he's a postmodernism, postmodernist, and he's also a right-winger as well. So I guess the interesting thing about this is that even though postmodernism is a political theory to an extent and considers socioeconomic parts of the ways we live in our world today, it can really be taken in any direction. And it's better to think of postmodernism more as a tool rather than a set doctrine that you need to believe in. And instead it's just a way of looking about things. Now, where did postmodernism begin? The first postmodernism is widely considered to be Jacques Derrida, who was greatly influenced by Saussure structuralism, and he put forward his ideas in his book of grammatology, which was published in 1967. So Jacques Derrida was really interested um, in language and linguistics and of grammatology is mainly concerned with grammar and the ways we understand the world through language. And we'll talk more about him in a future lecture. And the first to coin the term postmodernism was Jean-Francois Lyotard in his book, The Postmodern Condition. And he basically evaluated how we live in the postmodern world. And that was where the word postmodern and postmodernism came from. However, personally, I believe postmodernism to have begun with Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. And I think it provides the groundwork for most postmodern ideas. For example, his distinction between the abstract and concrete universal mirrors Baudrillard's theory of simulacra, which we talked about earlier this lecture. And so in the next session, we will discuss Hegel and his effect on postmodernism. And Hegel was one of the later German idealist thinkers. So he was alive and published most of his important works about a hundred years before most of the other postmodernists who are considered to be postmodernists in the traditional sense were even alive. So I think Hegel isn't that much of a postmodernist, but then 
his ideas then developed into postmodernism. And a lot of the postmodern thinkers are widely influenced by Hegel and his ideas. And although Hegel's famous for being very cryptic, I hope in the next lecture we'll try demystifying some of his ideas for you.